Uh, hi, my full name is Sridharan Chandramali. Um, I guess it's a mouthful, so let's not get there. Uh, so today's talk, I'm going to talk about using Angular components in a non-Angular application. So this talk is um, derived mostly from our experiences at the Lucid uh, software team and moving a complex web application over to Angular in a piecemeal manner. So hopefully, uh, I hope some of you would find it useful if you're trying to migrate your uh, application over to Angular. I hope you can derive some usefulness from this slide. Uh, before I start, I'm going to assume that you know some, um, you've been introduced to Angular before. I hope you've used it once before. Um, this being a short 10 minute talk, uh, I don't think I'll have the time to get into the basics. So let's get started. So what do I do? So I am a senior software engineer at Lucid. I work on the Lucid Press team. I um, predominantly do front end work, though I'm technically a full stack engineer. Um, and Lucid has two great web applications. These are very complicated, sophisticated web applications called Lucid Chart and Lucid Press. And um, before we ported over to Angular, we had over 700,000 lines of handwritten JavaScript code. And the UI components were mostly created using jQuery. Well, that's, that's fine if you have a small application, if you have a single page application. But for, an, for a code base as large and complex as us is, Things got out of hand really fast to the point where creating any new components took a considerable amount of development time. And we, we, we decided we needed a solution. And uh, so beginning of uh, last year, maybe around uh, July of last year, uh, we decided to move the entire Lucid Chart app over to Angular. So as you can see, the screenshot on the left shows the old uh, Lucid Chart app. And the screenshot on the right is the new uh, modernized uh, uh, Angular application, which is completely Angular. So it's great. Uh, developing new UI right now takes a fraction of the time that it took uh, initially. But there are some downsides to doing wholesale rewrite. Right? So for one, uh, if, if, you, if you have a large code base to begin with, you'd have two versions of the application for a really prolonged amount of time. So any features that you want to add, you'd have to add them in both those places instead of just doing it once. And A-B testing is a long and drawn-in process, right? So any time you want to uh, test if the new version of your uh, application is, any, as, is as good or even better than your old version, it's usually much easier to test it if, if the changes are small pieces instead of testing the entire application at once. And probably the most important one is that it's been a very resource-intensive application. We had a dedicated team of engineers working around the clock for uh, over six months to get it done. So, uh, when, it when it came time for the Lucid, uh, Lucid Press team to move their editor over to, the, uh, to Angular, we decided we don't want to do a wholesale rewrite. Instead, we wanted a piecemeal migration. Um, so this was the process that we had in mind. So we had a pure JavaScript application. Things were in jQuery. Things were ugly. Um, we wanted to move it. We, uh, we decided any new UI component that we create is going to be in Angular. So any new features we add, we add them in one place. They're going to be in Angular. And um, till, till we get to a point of criticality, you, um, the, uh, the JS still controls the entire application and then loads the Angular apps as, uh, as and when required. And slowly, once you build on the number of uh, Angular components you have, you can have an Angular app controlling and loading JS as it needs, and then finally moving to the goal of having a pure Angular app. Right? So if you want to do this, essentially there are two kinds of components that you'd want to load. There are the easy kind, and then there are the hard kinds. The easy kinds are components that are loaded on page load. They live for the duration of the uh, page. They don't, they, don't, they don't get destroyed. They, they live for the duration of the page load. Right, so, but there are other kinds of components which need to be loaded and destroyed um, based on, say, some user interaction. A user clicks a button, you want to show a call out. Um, those are the kinds of components which would we want, which has a very small life cycle, and uh, we'd want them to be loaded dynamically instead of having them in the memory um, and uh, taking up a huge uh, uh, taking up a huge memory resource, right? Um, so the first part, loading static components. As I said, it's a pretty straightforward component. If you think about it, it's, it's no different than loading any other Angular module, right? So all you have to do is mark the component that you want to load as a bootstrap component, add the selector to the DOM before you want to bootstrap the component, and then you're good to go. So here is a very quick example of this. So uh, up here, we have a selector. Uh, we have a component which is called the click increment component. It has a selector click increment. And then all it does is really it increments a value anytime someone clicks on it and then shows the value right away. Um, and then the only special thing you need to do is make it a bootstrap uh, 
component. And as long as your HTML file has the click increment selector in it before you bootstrap your application, um, here you bootstrap the application, you'd have, you'd have the component loaded, and things are fine. Right? But what if the selector is not part of the DOM one page load? Um, well, you could still do it if you follow these three steps. So the first step you'd want to do is mark the component as an entry component. So, so what does that mean? Well, if you, if you mark a component as an entry component, it tells Angular that this component is going to be loaded dynamically eventually. So even if it isn't part of an existing template, Angular would go ahead and create a component factory for you. So you can then use a component factory to actually create the, um, create the component. So, so you can see this is no different than the previous example, except it's been marked as an entry component here. Now, the second step that you would want to do is to create the component using a component factory resolver. Well, Angular does most of the stuff behind. Um, uh, Angular does it for you. So, um, well, let's, let's, let's see what a uh, factory resolver is. So a factory resolver is essentially has a references to the set of factories. You provide it with a component, it returns a factory which will create an instance of that component. That's, that's about all that it does. And um, the, the value that is returned by the component factory when you create a comp, uh, when, you, when you call create on a component factory, it returns a component ref, which is essentially a wrapper around the component instance. And it has some information um, as to where it's been stored. It, it has a host view, it has location, and a bunch of things that, uh, and also it sometimes even has inputs to the components. Um, so, the, so the way that you'd create a host view is, is uh, pretty straightforward as well. If you, if you think about it, first is you need a place to load the component. So say the user clicks a button, you want to load a component um, somewhere right next to where he clicks the button, you'd create a DOM and place the DOM where the user clicks the button. Right, so in this case, you're creating a new element called the click increment uh, uh, element, and then you're adding it to the document DOM. And um, after, and then what Angular does is once the app gets bootstrapped, Angular returns an ng module ref, which has an injector. And then once you have reference to the injector, all that you do is ask the injector for a component factory resolver. And assuming you already marked the component as an entry component, you can go ahead and um, create get a component factory from the resolver and then essentially create a component reference using the component factory. So all that this line does is it, uh, it passes in the injector, it uh, adds in the uh, place where you want to load the component, and then the component factory goes in and creates it, and then it returns a component reference, and then the component reference in itself has a reference to the host view. So finally, so right now we've created a component. It lives somewhere, but uh, the application has no uh, idea as to where the component is actually being. Um, uh, I mean, the application has no idea that the uh, component even exists at this point. So we need to make sure that um, we attach the component host view to the application ref for change detection. So uh, this is also, it turns out it's not a huge, uh, it's uh, Angular makes it easy for you as well. So you have an attach view uh, method on the application ref. So once again, you go get the uh, application ref from the injector um, after, after the app has been bootstrapped and then call attach view and then pass in the host view that you got from the previous step. So that's about it really. So uh, this piece of code uh, makes it easier so that it makes it reusable and that it adds another function called uh, uh, load component and DOM. Uh, it takes in the component that you want to load. It takes in an element where you want to load the component and then an optional function uh, which gets called when the component has actually been loaded. Um, and it does pretty much what we've talked about right now. And additionally, it also calls an on in it callback. So let's jump into how it works real quick. So I've got a, uh, let's do this, okay. Come on, okay. So, so I've, I've have a piece of code up in Plunker. Uh, if I can get my mouse working, okay. Okay. So here you go. So we have we have our app here, which we here we mark the component as an entry component right here, and then uh, this is the component that we saw earlier, and. Um, we have the dynamic loader here, which has the load component at DOM function, which does most of that work that we talked about earlier. 
And then um, in, our, in our index.html file, all we have is uh, two inputs here. Uh, one with an ID load component and the other with an ID remove component. And once we bootstrap the app, what we really do is um, we create a new instance of the uh, ng2 loader, um, and then we create a <clears throat> we get the reference to the container where we want to load the components, and then uh, we register an onclick function um, to <clears throat> we register a function on the onclick event for the add component DOM, and all it really does is it creates the click increment, and then uh, make sure it's part of the DOM and then calls the load component at DOM function. And uh, once that uh, loads successfully, we have a function which gets called with the instance, with the component instance, and then we set the value to whatever value that we want it to be. In this case, we have setting it to zero. And then we also store the references so that anytime someone wants to destroy it, all we go, uh, what, all that we do is loop through all the component references over here and then call the destroy function. So let's see this in working, right? So load component creates uh, multiple Angular components as and when you need it. When you click on it, it creates a new one. And remove components removes all of those. So that's essentially it. Um, so, so why is this helpful? Well, this is helpful because, as I said, it helps um, in migrating a huge uh, code base over to um, Angular in a piecemeal manner. And uh, with this, we've, we've found that the amount of resources that's required to move our code base is, uh, is, is cut by a fraction. And we actually do it as part of a sprint instead of dedicating an entire sprint or multiple sprints to move the editor over to Angular. So uh, there are a few things that we need to consider. One is inputs. Uh, if we want to load a component dynamically, any inputs to the components um, would have to be uh, set using a public interface on the component. Uh, we don't have an easy way of uh, setting the inputs. Um, and uh, the components in the JS uh, usually communicates via some events. So we use the Google Closure, um, yeah, Google Closure event targets for our code base internally. But uh, I'm pretty sure there are a bunch of other options that you could use. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, I hope you found this useful. Uh, we certainly did. When we started our migration, we didn't know if this was even possible. So this makes it so that Angular is no longer a monolithic piece of uh, code which you build all together. We could probably do it in a piecemeal manner. All right. Thanks. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, no, it does not because we have. So he said, uh, does bootstrapping um, modules have a performance impact? We haven't found a significant performance impact, mostly because we compile our templates ahead of time. So if you don't compile your templates ahead of time, then there may be some uh, uh, performance issues, but we do them. Um, so if you use ahead of time compilation, then um, we didn't see a significant uh, performance impact. Yep. Yes? Yes, so essentially what we do here is uh, any communication from JavaScript. Uh, so, so there are a couple of ways that you could do it. If you have a reference to the component instance, then your, uh, your communication one way from your JS to component instance is taken care of because you have the reference to the component, right? So that's straightforward. Um, say you don't have the reference to the component instance. In that case, you would have an abstracted uh, interface which, uh, which both the component and the JS listens on. So uh, what you do is the JS sets in, um, sets, calls a method on the interface, and the interface fires an event which the component listens on. Um, like you could, uh, so that works because you could, um, you could pass in stuff to the constructor. It's just that you cannot pass in input values to the components itself. So there are, there are a bunch of ways that you could do it. But essentially, if you, have, if you have the component reference, then just set values on the object one way. Cool? All right. Thank you. Thank you again, Sri. We appreciate it. Test, test. There we go. All right, five more minutes, and uh, Jen Luker will present on 
React. I just I had it in my mind. I have to cheat. Look at that. Styling React for reuse. And uh, so we'll have that and another prize.